First of all, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is, when you talk about important clients and powerful clients, I think we, we could have, within the advertising industry and marketing space, I think we have some of the most powerful uh, marketing people in the world. And so, um, and generally, advertising people can be accused of puffery, but I will tell you that that is actually the truth. Um, so we, we have uh, Dermot Bowden, who's the chief brand officer of Citigroup. Why don't we say so everyone knows? OK, great. Good evening. Um, we have Monica Schulze, who's the global head of marketing for the Zurich company. Hello. OK. We have Ann uh, Glover, who's the chief marketing officer for Voya Financial. And we have Frederick Tardy, who's the chief marketing and distribution officer for AXA. Good evening. Terrific. So, um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll just stand and then I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way so it'll be a little bit easier for me to ask questions. Um, so I think that one of the things that I was looking for, you know, was especially in the world today with, you know, very large global comp companies and you have conflicting targets of, you know, aging population and some younger millennials, how do you really market to those people? So I'm going to ask uh, a couple of people different questions. So um, Anne, okay, you're first. How do you reach dual target audiences who are at very different points in their lives with respect to those nearing retirement who have money today, and those are important people, or your long-term customers who are just starting to save? Great. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you for sort of lasting until the very end. We're all like thrilled about, uh, about that, and we want to let you know that we've heard that there's a glass of wine to thank you for, right. for sort of being an attentive audience. Um, but uh, to answer your question, we first of all start with a very clear proposition. And uh, for those of you um, who might not be very familiar yet with Voya Financial, we, uh, a large part of our business it, it evolves around selling retirement plans and services to, to consumers. That's, that's the majority of our, our business. And so we are convinced that we can help America retire better. And in order to do that, what we're going to do is make it easy for you to get your finances in order. And once your finances are in order, you'll be able to have a successful and a comfortable um, retirement. And from that basic proposition, we then go ahead and focus on the different media. I'm a huge, huge believer in integrated um, marketing campaigns. And one of the beautiful things that a marketing campaign, integrated marketing does is it lets you tailor your message to the specific audience that you want to reach. But we understand that at the very big level, we're talking about helping people retire comfortably and getting organized so that they can retire comfortably. And then you um, sort of can use social media if you want to speak very, very directly and in a personalized way to someone. Digital targeting helps us out with getting the right message to the right person at the right time. And um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's great to have all the tools as marketers that we have today at our disposal to, uh, to really be able to reach multiple targets. Great. Just one question. Do you have different creative teams working on those targets, or do you have the same team working across? It's the same team, and we, we actually pay a lot of attention to make sure that we have brand consistency, because we want, we're, we're optimistic. We're going to help you retire successfully, and we're, we're hopeful. And we've got to really make sure that the language that we use is, is, is great and similar across all our targets. Great. Fantastic. Dermot, City is um, one of the great global companies. Um, <clears throat> This is a re I'm sure everybody here wants to know how Citi has managed its brand reputation recovery since the financial ter turmoil of a few years ago. And in, in, in what ways, uh, the second part of the question, uh, do you, have you adapted messaging to your different target groups? Uh, Richard, um, uh, everyone knows, I think, that Citi uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago was having some problems, and we needed to uh, turn the corner. And uh, for the last few years, our, our, we've been focusing very much on becoming uh, smaller, simpler, safer, stronger. Um, and I think one of the challenges uh, for, for us in, in brand and communications is, is how do we start connecting that message uh, to our audience? Our audience is incredibly varied. 
We're in 101 countries around the world. Uh, we are doing business with consumers, nearly 200 million, more than 200 million. And we're also doing business with institutional clients, governments. And we have to be conscious, of course, of how regulators observe us, opinion leaders. It's a very broad audience, uh, truly on a global basis. And perhaps the most important target, if you wish, is the, is the, are the employees of, of City, 240,000 people, and trying to make sure that we're all effectively going in, the, in one direction. And it's, it's not, it has been a challenge, uh, not just for me, but for a group of us who have been trying to, to build a sense of one direction. <clears throat> We've utilized, we had a moment uh, uh, just recently, our 200th anniversary, and that was a very important opportunity for us <clears throat> to, to restate who we are, uh, to leverage the history of who we are, uh, and, and to start connecting with our consumers, with our, our, our clients around the world. Leveraging that through all of the touch points that, that are available to us. So clearly, uh, we, 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 we produce campaigns, we produce advertising, we, we are very conscious of, I'm sure like Anne, of trying to make sure that everything we produce is able to be leveraged uh, through social media, through digital uh, channels as well. Um, and I think we've been successful over time in building consistency. It's taken time to get to that point, but in building consistency and in building a, a, a common way for how people perceive us. Uh, leveraged, I think, importantly on that history. It's great. And I think you've, you've done a great job with the, with the brand consistency. I think it's one of the great financial brands um, you know, from a marketing point of view. Um, I was chatting a bit with Monica earlier, and I was trying to understand a little bit how big her business is in terms of how she's managing her business. And I think she told me, um, I think there are 55,000 employees at, well, that's right. So, you know, when you're working with, a, with you know, as, as in a capacity with that many people, how do you make sure that there's collaboration between regions and countries and the headquarters are working? How do you do it? With building of, uh, on what we just heard, I believe it's very important that you have a strong brand and everybody is proud to work against that brand. And before we went on stage, we had a story um, from a colleague of mine who um, impressed me at a conference because he said, whenever I go to a party and I don't, I'm not in the mood to talk to anybody and people ask me, what do you do as a living? Then he says, um, I'm selling insurances. <laughs> huh? <laughs> And, and when I'm in a good mood, I tell people I work in marketing. You know? <laughs> when I tell people I work in marketing, every, everybody stays with me and they still continue talking to me. If you talk about insurance, everybody gets bored and they leave. You know? So the question is, how do we instill pride into the company saying we help people to protect themselves? Because it's not about claims and disaster and whatever. It is about helping people to protect themselves. And what we did two years ago is that we relaunched our brand platform. And we're not now talking about if you truly love something, you have to protect it in the best possible way. And if somebody would have told me five years ago, in terms of insurance, we're going into the love direction, you know, it's a bit overdone now, I would have said no way and nobody will accept that. But it works. I mean, I have evidence and proof that this brand communication platform helps us to sell more. Uh, the creators are above average when it comes to performance, and I can also correlate um, the, the new communication we're doing to business. And not only that, it also instills a sense of pride, coming back to your mm -hmm. question. Because you can really take now also our employees to say, you can be proud that you help people to protect what they love, which is a great starting point. It is a good starting point. Yeah. Um, Frederick, um, here's a question for you. How are you in AXA utilizing social selling as a marketing and branding tool for your business? So <clears throat> social is very important for us. Uh, we, we, it, we are, it's the end of the uh, mass media. So I think that before we used to have uh, our media plan, it was uh, generally for the months of car, car insurance and after it was more for uh, home insurance and savings and like that. So now we are using uh, social signals to really uh, focus on a specific moment for, 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 for the customers. Uh, so we train our advisors at a global level to use uh, LinkedIn, to use uh, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we, we build a, a content factory and we are pushing content 
content uh, for them uh, to make sure that, uh, for example, when people are using uh, LinkedIn and they, they update the profile, we, we, we suggest uh, retirement product on savings when they just got an increase because they moved from company A to company B. So it's uh, really uh, uh, fantastic to use uh, social signals to increase sales. And we significantly uh, increase sales. And we are also using Elevate, the new product of LinkedIn, to push uh, content at a global level through our employees. Interesting. Now, are you uh, allocating more funds towards that? Is the, sh is the shift going a bit more towards that? From yes, we, we are moving a, a lot of budget from uh, traditional media to, uh, to, uh, to social media. And also, we have a dedicated budget for uh, R&D uh, because we, we, we think that uh, there is a lot to, to learn in, in the new media. Great. Now, I have um, a fun question for the group because I always say I'm a digital immigrant and I, my new company, after selling my old one, my new co company, NSG SWAT, has an army of millennials and they're all digital natives. Um, and it's a very unusual group because uh, to, to be very, very confident, um, I have to say I've seen a lot of entitled behavior, uh, more cynical um, than in previous uh, uh, groups that I've dealt with before. So when you're talking to millennials, um, and I'm, I'm, I'll, we can start this way back, uh, Frederick, um, we know they're highly empowered to make decisions, they're very educated, they're optimistic, yet they're highly skeptical um, and the less attached uh, than their parents. Um, how do you take that into, con how do you work with that when you're, when, when you're dealing with millennials? I think that first you have to recruit millennials uh, in your team and, and they have to, uh, to really have a great position in your company. Uh, second, I have to, you have to, to work with startups because most of the startups uh, will be run by, by millennials. So this is why we, we set up a lab in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, <clears throat> this is why we are partnering with, uh, for example, today we signed an agreement with Endeavor. It's a non-profit focusing on, on, on startups in emerging countries. And uh, all the CEOs of startups are millennials. So if, if you create these bridges and, and you fully understand uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and millennials, you, you are becoming more and more successful. Fantastic. And yeah, we pay a lot of attention to millennials, and we think that it's really, really important. And I'll give you an example here. You're new to your position, and it's your first opportunity to sign up for your employer's 401k plan. Oh my goodness, like, why would I want to do that? And we know that millennials, like, they're, they're, they understand that their employer has given the plan sort of an, a, a good housekeeping seal of approval, but other than that, they really know nothing about why they should do this. They hate to even sort of think about retirement. Like, why would I, why would I think about that? I, I'm just like starting my first job and maybe I should pay back a college loan. And so we are all about trying to make the whole journey a little bit easier for them. We know they need some advice in the beginning, so we want to give them some really good advice while they're thinking about should I sign up or not. We do things on our, our enrollment meetings like, have the ability for them to start to enroll and then maybe back up and go home and ask somebody and then come back in and enroll, you know, and finish the process. We want to make that process nice and smooth for them as they are deciding to sign up for the plan. And then we want to reward them, you know, help them understand that they did something good. Congratulations, you just like took a big step towards ensuring your future. You know, so so we are very much thinking about how can we make this process that you don't want to think about, to your point, insurance or you know, your financial future, that's doing something tomorrow. How can we make it more in today language for you and make it painless and help you feel really good about it? That's great. Monica? I learned today that repetition is important, so I will be boring, start with you have to have a great brand on an emotional basis, but then, of course, you have to deliver on the customer journey as well. And of course, we also are very much involved in our Palo Alto initiatives of understanding what is going on. And I'm a big believer in that you have to, and we talked about that today as well, get insurance into not once a year you have to renew your motor policy, and I'm taking the obvious and, and simple now, but how do you engage people on almost on a day-to-day -day basis? And we have seen some telematics examples today. Why can't I have real-time insurance? If I don't drive today, why do I have to pay if I drive tomorrow? then I have to pay. If I'm stressed and I need some motorway 200 kilometers, which is still possible in Germany, then I have to pay more. If I'm relaxed and only drive 100 kilometers per hour, then I pay less. You know? or, or if my, my husband drives the car and he ha happens to drive a bit calmer than I do, 
then he pays less than I do. I mean, things like that. And then you're getting into daily conversations with people, which is different thing than, oh, I have to renew my motor policy once a year. And I think we have to get insurance into a phase which is A, positive, and then also in a, into a constant engagement. Uh, and of course, there are great examples also from the Valley where you can, where you can see, yeah, you, you can get into future um, possibilities. Right. And we already have in, in uh, countries like Italy, for example, great experiences with telematics. Uh, and uh, the Italians are a bit better than the Germans with data, so we start now pilots in countries where it's a bit easier to get in opportunities like that. I like the idea of personalization. I think that's really smart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It also works well with the group you're talking to. You know. So Richard, I'm not entirely sure I agree with the premise. Okay. I think I think millennials are people we that we can build loyalty to. Uh, and I think they're there. I think you guys have just described effectively the importance of building that relationship over time, finding the, the thing that's relevant to them. And I, I'll tell you just an experience with City that particularly struck, struck me and struck my team as we thought about how we were going to reposition City. You know, the 200th anniversary I referred to, as I walked in the door, it never occurred to me that was going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, I just arrived in flew in on Delta. If, I, if someone had told me that Delta was celebrating its 50th anniversary that day, I wouldn't care. I'd worry about the age of the plane. So what, 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 and most brands don't, age doesn't matter. And yet, when we started telling people in 2012 that we were 200 years of age, the very same people who had earlier in a focus group or in a piece of research said, you guys are unreliable, you're not trustworthy, uh, we don't know if you're gonna be around, uh, as soon as we mention 200, suddenly we're reliable, we're trustworthy, we're going to be here because if we've been here for 200 years, and that's one of the things that people really wanted, those millennials wanted, mm -hmm. security, reliability at a time when the world wasn't. Sure. And so I think it is, you've got to find the right hook. Right. I'm not sure what that is and I think you, you, you're looking at ways of doing it, each of, each of us are trying to do that. And this isn't one that lasts forever. Effectively, it's history forward, right? We did all these great things over 200 years. We're going to bring you more. No, I think it's great. I think it's great finding that that hook for the consumer that they can really believe in. Um, we, we live in a we live in a really interesting time as people, you know, sort of um, those of us who've seen the changes. Uh, either you embrace them and you're successful, or you fight them and I think you're less successful. Um, and I th personally, I think. In my entire career, I think this is the most exciting time in my career because of all the new technology and the things that we can do with it. For each of you, um, Monica, we're going to talk to you first. What is the most exciting thing that you find about doing marketing today? I mean, what, what, do you, what really, when you wake up in the morning and you're most excited about what you're doing and how you're doing it, what, what inspires you? How, how do you? What's exciting to you? If I look back and I'm coming from a completely different background because I worked in FMCG and if you work for companies like Unilever, it's like the marketing people are the kings and queens and you're driving P&L uh, and you're owning the innovation funnel uh, and you're like, yes. So then I come, came to the insurance industry um, and I was asked to build up strategic marketing. You know? uh, and I completely um, underestimated that the culture was very different um, and it's not that easy because if it's an underwriting and sales culture and you're coming in there saying oh marketing is ruling the world now it's a bit difficult. <laughs> Listening to some of the presentations today where the challenge is does the chief marketing officer now also has to be the chief technology officer and marketing in the middle and marketing has to drive more which excites me is now that we're getting into the driving seat more and more. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that because I believe I need this power. I believe it because we have the power to understand the customer, and the customer has to be put more into the forefront. I had examples where it was like I went to my underwriters and they happily um, showed me a product where they said, oh, we are really proud that we developed a product. If your house burns down, afterwards you can build it 20% bigger. And I said, what? what? Did you ask the customers if they want to have that? And they were like, no, but the pricing model is great. You know? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that the sales guys can sell it because it's a great story. Then we went into market research, which they hadn't heard about before, but that's seven years ago. And the customer said, look, I'm buying insurances because 
I have the feeling that it helps me to prevent this risk, and I don't want to think about my house burning down, let alone, I don't want to build it 20% more because I don't have enough space. Yeah. So don't give me stories which sound great for you, but give me stories which are good for me. Yeah? And I think what excites me today is that we can really turn it around and have a completely different starting point, yeah? which we also discussed early on. Yeah? That's, that's really interesting. I, I love that thought. Yes, I think that uh, the world is changing very quickly, and it's an exciting moment. I think that today we are in, uh, in the world of internet, where the business model is uh, advertising. Uh, Tim O'Reilly said that uh, in the future we'll enter in the internet of things, and uh, the business model uh, will be the insurance. So <clears throat> we are entering in the connected uh, uh, world, and, and uh, for example, if I take uh, uh, car accident prevention, we used to, uh, to produce brochures, it was paper-based. Uh, so we recently launched uh, uh, an application, and, and it's connected with the Apple Watch, and you can measure your driving behavior and, and really understand how to improve uh, your, your behavior and to decrease uh, car accident. So we are moving to a quantified world where you, you can really quantify your, your action and a data-driven world where uh, marketing is make, becoming more and more scientific, especially for media. For example, with uh, programmatic buying, uh, now the, the head of media will become a data scientist. So it's a, it's a completely different world. It's a strong change for the uh, marketing function. Right. And it's a huge opportunity for marketers today. Right to being able to quantify it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, and what excites you? I'm a nerd, <laughs> so I will <laughs> like start there. And, uh, and I think like the two people that have just spoken, I get up in the morning and I'm psyched because there is so much more data available to us and we're mm. getting better and better tools every single day to understand how that data can be useful to us. And so what really excites me as, and why I wanted to do marketing is you get to ask questions, and then you can find the answers to those questions. Mm. And with data and, and, and analytics and a bunch of really smart people, you can really start to get answers to those questions. Mm. And I loved your example about the product. I, I have a background in, in packaged goods also, and uh, it, it is really nice to see people realizing that if you're going to reorient your company and put your customer at the center of the universe, you need people who understand how to ask those questions. And all of that, it really jazzes me. Yeah. Right. yeah. I, w I will say also, because a lot of times people think creative people, and I have always been a creative, you know, fight against the research. I actually love the research. To no, me, proof. it's the, because it's illuminating and it validates or invalidates your thought. So if you have a, a uh, if, if you're inquisitive, regardless of whether you're a creative or you're on the client side, you'll really enjoy the research process. I think it's one of the most important parts to the thing we do, we do in business, you know. Let. Well, I'm going to join the packaged goods uh, bandwagon because that's my experience too, my background as well. I remember those days with great joy. <coughs> um, the, the, the thing that I find attractive about what we're doing now in this world, back to research, is the power of social media and exploring that. I, I, I used to love doing what we called at Johnson & Johnson fundamental research, basic research, right? Mm. Trying, to, trying to watch people as they, you know, how did the flip top cap get developed? It got developed by watching a mother try and bathe a baby, and the mother couldn't, didn't have the third hand to turn the, the cap on, right? That's fundamental research. What can we learn through social media that people aren't telling us, that aren't being, isn't being overtly expressed, I think is really interesting. How can we listen, be the voyeur, listen, and, and understand and learn what's happening? And I just find this, this an incredibly exciting time for us as marketers to be able to get insights that we just weren't privy to in the past. Now, the other exciting thing, for, for me at least, is the, the, the continuing explosion of new, of new modes of communication through social media. So it's gotten to the point now that I've actually got a, a mentor. She's 28 years of age, and she's mentoring me in what's happening in the world of social media, because I, I just, it's hard to keep up. So I find it incredibly exciting and incredibly scary. It's so interesting that you say that, because that was part of my new model, which was, I wanted to mentor people, but I also wanted them to mentor me. And that's been very one of the most exciting things when you take away, uh, I think also within organizations, if you take away the layers and the senior people could work with some of the people entering the workforce, 
you, you're completely speaking um, a different dialogue. Um, I always like to, I lovingly call it Fifth Avenue to Williamsburg, you know, and people really seem to understand, you know, you get the flow information both ways. Um, it seems like we have, thank you, this, I think that was very interesting. Um, we have um, a, a little bit more time. I always like to ask to the audience if they have any questions of our group. Um, I mean, I can continue to ask more questions, but you're here, and I thought it would be interesting for everyone to participate. Uh, does anybody have any questions today for this distinguished group? Yes? Yeah, my question is for Anne. Uh, you talked a lot about data and all the policies that you're looking at. Um, a, what, what, um, what sources of data are you looking at? And you know, what departments are you working with to really aggregate all that information, analyze it? Do you really, at your level, have those, you know, key um, points that'll say this is the right strategy or we've missed the mark here. I mean, how do you take Can you, all I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part so that everybody here, I don't know if everyone here the first sure, part of your of question. Sure, of course. My question was for Anne at Voya, um, really around uh, data. You're indicating that you're using a lot of data sources to help inform your strategy. And certainly I think the challenge is identifying all those sources and then pulling them into something meaningful that you can easily analyze and make clear business decisions on. And I know you mentioned uh, some tools that you're working, uh, that you utilize to help with that. So I'd be interested in what you are utilizing. So I, I am not the modeler, and I don't want to do a public service commercial for, for any of our partners. However, what I will say is that the, the first data that we're interested in is our customer data, and, and our customers do marry the American population. And so we very much, uh, we append all of our customer data with household information so we can really get a complete, a, a complete picture of, of our customers. And then around, I'll just give one example, around the science of predictive analytics, there are some great, great tools um, and, and lots of great partners um, that, that will help you sort of understand, well, they won't help you understand how to use the data, they will make sort of data come to you in a way that you can test or learn much more automatically. And I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Great, any other questions? I saw some yes back there. The gentleman over, over here, yes. Hi. Uh, if you can pick any good experience on content in your industry, in, in the financial, financial industry, any great example of how to use content in social media? I think that uh, it, it's, uh, it's important to, uh, to have a, a very broad uh, um, uh, content. So for example, we, uh, we put our advisors on, on LinkedIn and, uh, and for example, we, we, we push a, a, a job position for a data scientist in, in the, the advisor network. And it was uh, great content to get, get CVs, but also uh, great content to push the brand. And the advisors are becoming uh, brand ambassadors. And when they can at a local level to do very uh, uh, hyper local content, uh, it's very efficient and, and, and it's very successful and it's very complementary to, uh, to uh, global or national content. I had good discussions with LinkedIn this morning, so thanks a lot to our host. Uh, I think that we can use platforms like LinkedIn quite well in order to say, especially for our B2B audience, what are the key trends? Where can I play and make a difference? Because if you look at uh, topics like cyber risk, everybody's hugely excited about today. Everybody's writing about it, not only insurance and financial services, but a lot of um, companies. The question for me is how can I use data to find something where I can create content with, which is special, of relevance for the target group, and where I, as Zurich, can make a difference and people associate that to the company. And I think that is very important when it comes to content. Because it's not only about pushing out content, because I'm hugely knowledgeable about risk management or other topics. It's about finding a space where I can play, where others cannot that easily play, mm -hmm. and make a difference, and thus building my brand. Great. Dermot, did you have any? Uh... No, I, mean, we, I, I completely agree. I, I think uh, uh, we, we had, a, an, uh, I think, a campaign that was very successful along the lines that you're talking about with, with the Olympics. We, here in the US, we sponsored the US Olympic Committee. And so we partnered with uh, uh, 10 athletes, and effectively they became the creators of our content. And to be able to leverage them, these athletes of course were carefully chosen, <coughs> consistent with what City stands for and what the brand wants to stand for, but progress and, and so forth. 
And, and by leveraging what they were effectively, we were helping them, of course, produce this content, but this was content that allowed, allowed our consumers to engage with them. We created a program where uh, for, every, uh, uh, for every like on Facebook, a dollar was donated to a, a, a sport program charity, basically, that, that this, each athlete liked. And it enabled a, a real sense of connection, because it, it's all very well, I think you were saying this, creating content, if it doesn't connect in a way that's consistent with the brand, consistent with what you want to talk about, and that's relevant to the people you're talking to, it's pointless, right? And that's where, uh, that's, I think, I was, so I'm quite proud of that particular event in, in the Olympics. Right. That's interesting. Great. Yeah, I would just add to that, it's, it's all about contextual relevance. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, on, we know that people have huge affinity towards sports, and we do a lot of advertising um, on sports events, but it's about more than just sort of having a television ad, right? If you're, uh, if you're sponsoring tennis, you want to watch the orange ball sort of go back and forth and do that tennis moment, and then you want to tweet, and we had, did a whole series of uh, animals and tennis balls, and the dog was saving the orange balls, and we posted those uh, on Facebook, because, and people like really enjoyed and, and shared all of those posts. Remember, too, that we're at a stage in our life cycle where we've only been out in public with the Voya name to all of the consumers for six months. So we're doing right. things to really try and, sure. and, and raise our, our brand name. But we would use Twitter a little bit differently, much more you know, sort of focused on what's happening in the moment than we would on would Facebook. And then LinkedIn, we know a lot of our distribution system is, uh, is on LinkedIn. And so to your point, absolutely use that for um, helping advisors be better advisors. And right. I think you, you need also to be disruptive in terms of, of content. Mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we are helping uh, athletes that want to retire to, to, to become uh, agents at AXA. And uh, we, we identified a, a startup in Silicon Valley called Quart Quarter, and, and they provide second screen experience to, to synchronize your smartphone with a, a sport event. And, and uh, we, we had uh, uh, agents commenting uh, um, a sport event uh, on, on, on Twitter and, and through this uh, social media app, and it was very, very successful. And it was very, very specific content that you, can't, you cannot find and very typical uh, to Axe agents. So, so it's very, uh, very efficient if you want to, to have a, a, a disruption in, in the way you produce content and diffuse content. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, does anyone on this side of the aisle have a question? If not, I have one last question myself. Does anyone, any other questions? Okay, I, I want to know in your mind, because I know there's a huge, uh, shift in media, um, do you st all still believe in um, image advertising, you know, the way that it was done before, or is it, do you still believe in advertising, you know, some image advertising, you know, with a mix, like what's the, you know, have, has, has your opinion changed, you know what I'm saying, um, or do you see the value in that? I mean, you, as you're saying, the Voya name is new, so you might have a different opinion, you know, than City, who has, you know, been around for 200 years. Um, who wants to take that question? I'm happy to take it. So I'm, I, as 20 years ago, I still believe you have to have a very structured approach. You have to define your target group. Then you have to understand how this target group is consuming media, where you have to um, find this group, how do you have to cater against the, the channels, and then choose your messages as well. And I still believe that you have to touch the heart of the people as well as, as getting into hard facts in your, in your products. Uh, and this is why I also believe sometimes you have to get into image. Does that mean you have to use TV or print? No, it does not mean that. But you have to, I mean, go into analysis, look at the data, and then look at your target group, how they consume media. Great. That's a very clear answer. Does anyone else have an opinion about that? I, very strong one, actually. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've always felt that the best advertising does both. and. Uh, as we're launching the Voya brand, if any of you have seen those orange money commercials, it's all about the orange dollar bill and being able to fill up that, the dollar bill's green underneath, and as you save more money, the dollar bill becomes more and more orange. And that visual is something that, you know, we hope will become fairly iconic, and uh, that message can carry through all the way to sales materials and back to that millennial who's trying to enroll. How cool is it if I click on that if I save at 10%, this is how much money I'm going to have on a monthly basis when I, you know, sort of get ready to think about uh, the next part of my life. But if I only save 3%, 
this is the, there's only like a slight sliver of that orange dollar bill that's going to be colored in. Right. That's a great example. That is a good yeah. example. Frederick, Jeremy. I think that uh, with programmatic buying, I think that the, the way we are uh, buying media is completely changing, and, and this is why, uh, for example, at, at, uh, at a group level, uh, globally, the, the head of, of media is a data scientist. I think that the, the, the function is really changing, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, uh, it's important. Yeah, Great. yeah I think this absolutely must cover the full spectrum. We've got to sell product. We also want to create an image for, for the brand and, and our reputation, and ideally would do both. Whatever we develop, certainly I think in City today, whatever we develop, it has to be effective across all the available forms of media. So it has to be there and can, and can actually communicate in any, in any avenue. Uh, and it has to be able to do both. Ideally, it would minimally, if it's a, a piece of image, I'm not sure, still not sure what that means, but mm -hmm. a piece of enterprise or communication about a message, it needs to have a halo on the products that yeah. we're going to sell. I meant image by saying it's not, it's not directly linked to return on investment. Right. You, know, you know, where someone has to believe that, I mean, content's that way too, but you know, I, and I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's old school print, but you know, there ha when someone's writing a check, when a client's writing a check and they're, you know, it's much easier to write a check if you know that you're doing direct mail or something like that, you know? But, but yeah, so Richard, I guess there's a way around that, and that is as a consequence of seeing this image stuff, are you more likely to do business with me now than you were before? Right. So there's ways, even if it's not necessarily, I'm going to buy the product for sure, at least there's right. a way of getting at that, I think, which is right. important. Well, and the data and the, helps. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I was going to say the data helps you, too, yeah. because it's uh -huh. about like where yeah. in the consideration funnel, yeah. you know, where, in the, where yeah. in the consumer funnel is that message going to help you out? And I think we have a lot more um, sophisticated opportunities to prove out to our organizations that you need that upfront brand to be built. Right. And, and one thing that I do every senior meeting that I'm in, when people talk about the expense line that is marketing, I'm like, no, that is the investment line that is yeah. marketing. And let's remind you, yes. you know, what you're getting for that investment. It's so funny that you yeah. say that because many, many years ago, one of our first clients at KMB when I first found the company was Bear Stearns and Ace Greenberg, who's the, the founder, was very legendary. And when they introduced me, I must have been like 25, and I went up to him and they said, oh, this is Richard Kirschbaum, he's running the advertising. And he said, oh, you're the guys that take money out of my bonus as opposed to putting in <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was very funny. But, but the, the big trick today is, and this is the beauty of data as well, that you can find at least correlations between what you're doing and, and the output. Yep. And I have one example where we really set up uh, an image campaign, uh, looked at the leads coming through the website. I had a group taking care of those leads and I could correlate to sales. It's a simplistic way of describing it. It was a right. complicated process. But we managed to say, here's what we have on air. And then we had sales at the end coming out as well. And I could prove that without even lo looking at product offerings, if you run image campaigns, you have already an effect. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. You're then stronger if you have a specific offering as well. I mean, I could see that effect as well. Right. But the beauty of data and all this technology is today that you can go into return and invest. And that's the big trick as well. Uh, return and invest is the big thing we can push right. forward. And it's not about discussion on cost. Right. No, I think it's great. And I will also say, because I know we're, we're about ready to wrap up, but I will tell you that having lived through the financial crisis in this country, and I'm sure we all know and felt certain things, you know, we all wonder what we do is what we do really important, and I think that, you know, you're all stewards of great brands, right? And if people feel comfortable that there are financial institutions that are responsible and can help them achieve their goals and are going to be there in a financial crisis or not, you know, it makes consumers feel much more comfortable about their lives. You know, so I think we're all, you know, in terms of what we all do, because sometimes you can question, is what we do really important? I personally think it, it's, in, you know, incredibly important. And I think that, you know, the idea of also how you are, you're, you're responsible and guardians of these great brands for, to make people's lives better. So I just want to say, you know, it's a complete pleasure for me to have moderated the session. And um, I don't usually get a chance to have this much firepower in one room, you know what I'm saying? And so thank you all uh, very much. Um, and uh, I guess we've just uh, completed the three to one zone. And uh, so thank you all for having us.